And thank you to the VCU ACE program for inviting me here. Uh, hopefully you're here for the, the obsession piece. Um, there's a lot of times when parents will ask me, uh, how do I get rid of this obsession? And I'll say, good luck. You're not going to extinguish it. It's going to come back in some other ways. You might as well make the most of it. So that's why we're going to be looking at um, how to put these high interest areas in, uh, in ways that will help our kids become more productive and hopefully go on to become productive citizens. So with that in mind, one of the, the things I would like to call attention to is the Organization for Autism Research. Um, it is a, a website that I uh, encourage you to visit uh, possibly every two weeks. It's, it's the only uh, website that is going to give you applied research with real kids in real classrooms. And so you're going to see a lot of ideas. They have lesson plans on the website, lots of ideas that I'm going to give you today. I've often got, um, I've also gotten from the website, so just be aware of that. Um, one of the very first things I want to talk about is a, a tool called Power Cards. Power Cards uh, use a high interest area, uh, maybe a favorite character. It might be uh, uh, a favorite um, high interest area. So we've used it with electricity, computers, vacuum cleaners. And so you're using that high interest area uh, to create a kind of a character that you want that student to emulate. Um, Elisa Gagnon uh, is the author of Power Cards. It's a very short book. When I read the book, I was so impressed because at the time I was doing a lot of social stories with my students. And a lot of my students were tired of social stories. So when I read Power Cards, I thought, hey, this might be a way of, uh, of introducing, maybe either using it as a supplement or maybe instead of the social stories. And throughout the years of using it, all the way from a three-year-old to an 18-year-old, um, I've been very successful using them. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of power cards. It's a fun, a really fun uh, tool to use. So I'm going to share with you some of the ways of using it. Sometimes some of our students um, have some characters that are violent characters. And um, this was one such student that I worked with who uh, was a middle school student. He was really into Stone Cold Steve Austin. So much so that he was emulating Stone Cold Steve Austin. He was choking them, uh, stepping on some of the students' heads. Um, and he also talked in a very loud voice, just like Stone Cold Steve Austin. So at first we did a social story to address the, the violent piece because, again, he was alienating a lot of students uh, in the gym, out on the playground. So we, we first used a social story, and that decreased the behavior somewhat. Uh, the teacher also used a levels of talking. She's actually one who came up with this levels of talking. Um, and on this levels of talking, you can see um, all the way from a zero to a five. Um, the five was an on-stage voice, a stone cold Steve Austin on-stage voice. Because again, he always talked in that very loud voice. She had this up for everybody in the classroom not just for this young man, but he also had a smaller, a smaller card uh, that was right there on his desk that she could put a paper clip on it. And when his voice was at a five, she could just move that paper clip down to a four, down to a three, down to a two, whatever level uh, that she wanted his voice to be at that particular level. And it, again, helps somewhat. It also was a neutral situation because it wasn't the teacher telling him. It was Stone Cold Steve Austin telling him where his voice needed to be. So again, that, that kind of helped a bit. The other thing, and I, I think as you notice today as we go through um, the, the, the program, you're going to notice that this is kind of a layered. It's not just one 
uh, technique. You're going to have several techniques in place. Another suggestion uh, was using a power card. And at first, the teacher said, mm, I don't think it's going to work with him. He's too smart. He's, he's not going to respond very well to that. Well, I downloaded the, the Stone Cold Steve Austin, put the picture right there on a 3x5 card on the front, and then the story on the back. And the next day, he read the story, and this is what the story said. I'm going to read it to you as we go along. Stone Cold Steve Austin talks in a very loud voice on stage. He wears black boots and stomps people on stage. He uses a stranglehold on his opponents on stage. Off stage, Steve Austin talks in a library voice to his children when he reads stories to them at night. He doesn't hurt his wife or children by choking them or stomping on them. He is off stage, just like me. I'll use my library voice or my partner voice at school and home, and I'll use my stone cold voice only on stage, just like me. The beauty of this is that it worked. It didn't work the first day, didn't work the second day, but after reading it three, four, five times a day, um, then you could actually see from the data that the strangle holes, uh, stomping on people, and even the loud voice started decreasing. Now, is it because of the social story? Is it because of the levels of talking card? Is it because of the power card? It's probably because all three of them were being used at the same time. And that's why it's so important to take your data. And we're not going to talk a lot about data today, but you're going to notice that when you start using some of these visual strategies, you're going to see a decrease in behavior. And that's when you need to start taking your data at that point. Um, the other thing, the other beauty of using a power card is that oftentimes it can just be right there on the student's desk, on the corner of his desk. He's got his Stone Cold Steve Austin or perhaps some other uh, um, power cards right there on his, his um, uh, desk. And the teacher can just go by and point to it. She doesn't even have to say anything. She just has to point to it. Um, oftentimes, as adults, we talk too much. We start explaining things to that child. Now, honey, if you don't do this, you're going to get in trouble. And, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin says this. You don't have to go into that much detail because at some point, students want to just say, stop the talking. You're talking too much. That's why over here on the slide I have, remember, when behavior starts to escalate, it may be best to talk less and show more. Um, we know this to be a fact that our students with autism spectrum disorders, they are more visual than they are auditory. And oftentimes when we use these visual strategies, it will then get from their short-term memory to their working memory and then finally into their long-term memory. And that's where we want to uh, get it into that long-term memory. Another one of my favorite sayings is right here on the slide. And this is actually one that I used quite a bit as a reminder for myself because I, I was a teacher who talked a lot, um, and oftentimes talking a lot, and the more excited I get, the faster I talk, and the louder I got. So I had this posted over my desk, and it's talk low, talk slow, and don't say much. It's an old John Wayne saying, and my teacher assistant was really good about cueing me, you know, when I did start to, to become too excited or, or talk too fast. Uh, but we've gotta remember to cue ourselves oftentimes around our kids. Um, talking less can actually be better, showing them more. Some more power cards I'm going to share with you. Um, Elisa Gagnon, in her book, recommends no more than two power cards going on at a time. Many of our kids can make liars out of us. And this is a student that I'm going to introduce to you who uh, had several power cards going on at the same time. He was a young man who was a sixth grader. When I heard about Derek in fifth grade, uh, Derek was having several meltdowns a day. Uh, he had started out in a regular ed fifth grade classroom and by the end of the school year, he had ended up in a self-contained program all by himself. So when Derek started on the middle school campus, his 
middle school principal said, we're not going to have this. We're going to make sure that everybody is trained. And so that is what we did. We trained all the teachers who were going to be in coming in contact with Derek. He did start out one-on-one -on -one with that special ed teacher. And as time went on and we started including him more and more into those sixth grade classrooms, there were some things that were put in place, some things that probably you already do yourself, things like um, schedules. He had his individual schedule. He had a transition marker, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. He also had a work system in his classroom that he followed. And once he finished job A, job B, job C, then he could go on his break. At first, we wanted him to take his break in that regular ed classroom. And because of Derek's sensory issues, it was way too overstimulating for him. So instead, he went to the special ed classroom where he took his seven to 10 minute break just to kind of come back together. Oftentimes, it was on the computer. He had some other fun things. But we also discovered that he loved Star Wars. So in the next few slides, you're going to see some power cards that we wrote using some of the characters from Star Wars. This first slide was done uh, with Yoda. Um, and it was just to give him uh, information on uh, what choices he may have. And I'm just going to read this to you. A, a Jedi Knight knows how to control the forces of the dark side. You can do this by doing one of the following. You can go to the library, ask for more time on the computer, turn the lights off, take one of your favorite things to the cool down area, your Leapster or your dinosaur. Well, he liked this one. And once we had him hooked using this power card, the other power cards came along much easier. And he loved his power card. This is the next one we wrote. I found out that there was a yodel. You know, we learned so much from our kids. I didn't know that much about Star Wars, but I found out that yodel is Yoda's girlfriend. So we used the next one for yodel. And this particular one we wrote to help integrate him back into the lunchroom. As you well know, many of our kids with autism have a really difficult time in loud places such as lunchrooms. PE, uh, transitions between classes. Uh, so this is one of the reasons we wrote this, to encourage him to stay longer in the lunchroom. He did have a break card that if he needed to take it to get out of the lunchroom, he could appropriately uh, show one of the teachers that he needed to take a break out of the lunchroom and away from the, the noise level. But for the most part, we were trying to encourage him by letting him know that after lunch, he is going to have a break before he goes right back into his, his uh, regular ed classroom. This is one uh, that we wrote uh, to introduce him to his transition marker. Now, earlier I mentioned transition markers. His transition marker was a Luke Skywalker. It was a, uh, a baseball card size picture of Luke Skywalker. And on the card, it said, check your schedule. That's all a transition marker is. It means check your schedule. It takes you directly to the schedule. The beauty of transition markers is that it encourages that student. It's a visual cue to go check his schedule so that he, if he's on his very favorite thing. Let's just say this is a student such as Derek who loved the computer. And now you're asking him to go check his schedule so that he can go to uh, math, and he hates math. And now you want him to go to math. Now, it's not you telling him to go check his schedule. It's not the teacher assistant telling him. It's Luke Skywalker telling him to go check his schedule. Now, is it going to work the first time? Probably not. Uh, the second time, you may need to do it many, many times uh, before he finally realizes that this means go check your schedule. And the, uh, the good thing is you're teaching it during the calm because there may come a day when he's very upset, such as oftentimes when Derek would come in. Uh, he may be very upset. So therefore, when he just is handed his schedule, he's much calmer. Um, and that's his cue, go check your schedule. So this is one that, that introduced that transition market. Uh, the next one with Queen Amidala 
is one that we wrote because even though he was um, standing up for the pledge, oftentimes uh, instead of saying the pledge, he would say other things and just randomly talk and, um, or sing a song or whatever. So this is one just to encourage him to recite the pledge, even if he's just quiet during that time. You also notice that number two where it says stand quietly during the moment of silence. We had to change that from moment, from minute of silence to moment of silence because at one point it was only 59 seconds and he got very upset because it was only 59 seconds. So that's why we changed it to a moment of silence. This next one I thought was, was so clever. The, the classroom, one of the classroom teachers did this and as she showed it to me, I thought it looks so very broad, the rules. The Jedi are the guardians of peace. Jedi keep hands and feet to self. Jedi seek knowledge and training. But then what I realized she did, number one and number three are rules that he says quite often about the Jedi. She sandwiched in between number one and three what she wanted him to do. And I just thought that was so clever because he followed it just as if it was a Jedi rule. This last one's my favorite one. And this is, this is the one the coach did. Chewbacca likes PE. Exercise is good. We change into our PE clothes. We listen to coach. We do our exercises. Even a Wookiee needs a good workout. Derek loved his power cards so much that he didn't need to be encouraged to read them. Alisa Gagnon uh, makes the recommendation in her book that you read them several times a day, especially before the times when there might be a, a stressor or be time when, a time when they might be demonstrating some of the inappropriate behaviors. Um, he did not need the, the encouragement. Every time he went on break, every class period, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to read his power cards and he would read them over. So in this next video, you're going to see him reading his power cards um, and getting excited about it. Uh, that's why we think it was embedded in his brain. The other thing you're going to notice is when we videotaped this, this was in March when we videotaped this, several couple years ago. By that time, he had not had one meltdown since November not one meltdown. Now, we're talking about a student who had had several a day, anywhere from three to five per day uh, when he was in fifth grade. And we also feel like that because he had so many of these strategies put in place, and as I said earlier, his schedules, his work systems, power cards, social stories, transition markers, you know, I already named several things that he had in place. We really feel like that these supports helped eliminate so much of the, the behavior that was disruptive. The other thing too is that the kids liked him better and that was the beauty of it. Uh, the kids earlier were afraid of him. Uh, now that his behavior, appropriate behavior, had, had increased, um, he was being invited, he was kids were talking to him and we're talking about a middle school campus where um, many of the, the judgments can be pretty harsh. So that, that's the good news. That's, that's a really good one. Here's one. Well, here's Derek uh, in the video. With the cameras. Go to the library. Ask for more time on the computer. Turn the lights off. Take one of uh, their favorite things to do um, down area. We still are dinosaur. Next, Queen of Adalas, respect for c country as in school. I know how to show respect for country in school. You can ch show respect by doing the following. Stand and re recite, re recite, re what? Recite, is it? Recipe. No, recite. R-E-C-I-T-E. What, what does recite, recite mean? Recite the pledge. Yeah, what does it mean to recite? Silence. To say it. To say, say it. it. Mm -hmm. I recite. 
stand quietly during the minute of silence. Sit quietly and listen to announcement. There are two more left, and that's it. So I can play the camera, right? Mm -hmm. That's for a few minutes. For a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. It's for me and you, right? That's right. I yes. can share. You yes. can share. We're both going to share. You're in. We can, we, I'm pretending to bug as word voice, okay? That's a good voice. We can, we change into our PE clothes. We listen to coach, we do our exercise. <laughs> There's one at the bottom, what, is, what does it say? Even a woogie needs a good workout. One more, we do woo. Yeah. Why? Here. Okay, the next one is a little bit different. It's a second grader, a younger child, and as you can see, uh, she liked Dora the Explorer. I made the mistake of downloading a Google image of, of Dora and then writing it up and then showing it to her the next day. She did not like it at all. And I thought, oh well, I guess this is one power card that's not gonna work. Well, that's because she wanted to draw her own Dora the Explorer. So that's exactly what she did. She did her own Dora the Explorer. And you're gonna see right there on the left-hand side, she even wrote her own power card about fire drills. It's, it's similar to what I had written, but lo and behold, it's better than what I wrote because she wrote it in her own words. And it says, sometimes we have surprises like fire drills. We line up, go outside, wait, wait, wait. It's okay because we have to practice. On the right-hand side, you see the one uh, uh, that the teacher assistant wrote for her. Uh, and again, she's the one who wanted to, to uh, draw and illustrate it. She's another one who had more than two power cards going on at the same time. Uh, and again, they worked. In this next one, this was for a much younger child. This is for a three-year-old. And as you can see, he's, his favorite character is Elmo. Elmo likes it when people use safe hands. Elmo wants Preston to use safe hands. Remember to clasp your hands to be safe. Elmo loves when Preston remembers to use safe hands. Just four simple sentences that he would understand. And again, with this piece, it could also be role playing, what it might look like actually using Elmo. This was the year when I met so many kids who loved Star Wars. I learned more about Star Wars than my whole years of life. This was a high school student. And the beauty of this is that um, this was a young man, high school student, very, very intelligent. And I bet after I read this that you can figure out what the problem was. I am Luke Skywalker and I have some great ideas to share with others. I like to raise my hand and answer the question. Well, here's Luke saying, the teacher needs to call on other students so that they can share their ideas too. I want my friends to have a chance to answer. Now, Brendan wrote the part at the bottom and I'm going to read it to you exactly the way he says it. To become a Jedi requires the deepest commitment and most serious mind. It is not a venture to be undertaken lightly. As such, Jedi instruction is rigidly structured and codified to enforce discipline and hinder transgressions. And that is exactly as he would read it. And every time he would read it, I would just, just die laughing. But again, for him, it was meaningful. Apparently, you figured out that he is one who would blurt answers out, even though the teacher would tell him, Brendan, I'm not going to call on you until you raise your hand. And then Brendan would raise his hand. And it, because he had blurted out, he had already given so many answers, the teacher, of course, would call on others, and then he'd get mad. What we didn't realize is that the function of that behavior was really attention and acknowledgement. 100% of the time, Brendan knew the answer. He knew exactly what the answer was. And um, 
So what we did, and you're going to notice on the back side of the card, we wrote what's called, what they're called keychain key rules. Keychain rules are a technique that you're going to see several of them in just a moment. But this is a technique where we put together some, some ideas for him just as a little checklist. And you're going to notice when the teacher calls on someone else in class, Luke Skywalker wants you to remember that you can do one of the following things. Wait and listen. Take one or two deep breaths. Write your answer down on paper. Now this one right here was the key. And I say it was the key because it was one of those things that we hit upon that once he wrote his answer down and the teacher was encouraged, just go, down, go by and say, you're right, that's correct. Then all that blurting out behavior went by the wayside. All he needed was acknowledgement that I know the answer, this is correct. And that's the beauty of it. It goes back to, it may not be just one technique that's going to work. It may be several techniques that you're going to, to layer. And that's exactly what happened for this, this young man. This next one, this is a, another example of a keychain rule. Keychain rules, when they were started, were actually done um, on the outline of a key. And the keys would be put together on a key ring. So there are rules, individualized rules, that you want that student to remember. Many of our students who are younger, such as our kindergartners, kindergartners, our first graders, they like it on the outline of a key. In Brendan's case, it was just on the back of that power card. Um, in some cases, we've actually put keychain rules where they're on just strips of, of card stock and put together on a keychain and especially for our older students. And that has seemed to help oftentimes. This is for my own son, Drew, who is with me here today. Um, Drew is now 24 years old. He is, uh, uh, has fragile X as well as autism. He has a twin brother who also has autism who is at a, a much lower cognitive functioning level. And uh, Drew is, is uh, graduated and has always wanted to be uh, a model, so he actually has an agent. So when the agent called and told him that uh, he has an interview, his very first interview in San Antonio, he got very nervous and um, was refusing to go. He was not going to go to the interview, which was a very scary thing because we had gone through a lot of trouble to, to get this interview. So Drew's high interest areas um, are Hannah Montana, si Miley Cyrus, and, and he's really into that. So in the next few slides, you're going to see the, uh, the power card that um, I wrote for Drew. Drew's fabulous interview. Miley Cyrus is a TV and movie star. She had to go to many interviews to get these jobs and become famous. Sometimes she used to get a little nervous about meeting new people and talking to them at the interview. Miley would try to remember that an interview is just a chance to meet new people and tell them about herself. When you get all dressed up and smile, the interview can be lots of fun. Miley wants to tell you a secret, so shh. Here it is. Just take a deep breath, smile and be your great self, Drew. That's how she became Hannah Montana. Now, in this next video clip, you're going to see us reading it. We're at Starbucks. We're waiting to, uh, for the agent, um, a good friend of mine, and, and her sons to come pick uh, Drew up to go to the interview because his mother's not going to go with him to the interview. His agent's going to go with him to the interview. So you are going to see us reading over the interview um, and then the aftermath as well after the interview. So this next slide will have the video. Yeah. 
we're now going to get into some more strategies. I've, I've covered power cards, and I encourage you and hope you've used, you will use some of the power cards. On the next few slides, we're going to get into the, the, the premise behind all of this. This was at a, at a high school campus, and I'm going back into the parking lot, and I see this sign on the, 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 the ground of the parking lot to look both ways. And of course, I'm thinking, don't we already know this? I mean, don't high school students already know to look both ways? Well, apparently not, because I think there must have been a, uh, uh, an accident or something. The whole reason I'm showing you this is because what we know is that the visual strategies are the strongest. And uh, our visual strategies are, this is their, their foremost way of taking in information. In fact, oftentimes when under stress, this is how they take in information. The auditory processing pretty much shuts down. What we also know, though, is that those visual strategies may also be the strongest link between the brains of people who are autistic and the brains of people who are neurotypical. This was actually in my husband's office at one point, and I loved it so much. If we can teach them the way that they learn. As we go through the, this web, uh, webcast, we're going to be talking about all the visuals. And of course, today we're focusing on um, their interest levels, making sure even in their academics, their interest levels are there in some way that they're getting that as a reinforcement. You know, we talked about encouraging their behavior through power cards. We can also talk about that every child can learn just on the same day on the, or the same way. I think, too, you've probably picked up that as we go through the power cards or the keychain rules um, or transition markers, some things I've already covered, those are taught during the calm time. You don't teach it, you don't teach swimming when they're drowning. Um, you teach swimming when, when they're very calm. And that's the same thing, the reason why we want to consistently use these. We don't bring these things out when there's a crisis situation. We use these every day so that when there is a crisis situation, they now be can, be can, can be used as, as intervention strategies. Here is a technique called the surprise card. Because our students many times do not respond well to changes in schedule, or surprises, fire drills, or here are the drug dogs who have come on campus. Um, surprise cards can be an effective way, whether they're three years old, whether they're 18 years old, to, to uh, cue them that, uh-oh, here's a surprise. And in fact, this is a young man, a, a junior high student who loved Einstein. This is why we're using the Einstein surprise card. So we use this to cue him, and along with it, to introduce what that means, we used a social story. And this is a PowerPoint social story that played on his, his iPad uh, so that it would, as a reminder, um, that when he sees this card, that means, uh-oh, that there may be a surprise. Here it is. Sometimes there are changes or surprises in my day. That is okay. When someone gives me this card, this means there's a change or surprise, and that is okay. Again, three simple slides, but it's just something that's repetitive. He sees it every single day. He sees it every class period. There is many, many examples that you can use. You know, one such one was one that we used in order to, uh, it was a baby, a big baby with a big surprise on, on the, the, the face. and. You would, be, you would be surprised how much our high school students loved it. They love to see that surprise card. The whole premise behind this is that anticipating change helps to respond to change. When you are alerted and you know that something's going to happen, even a few minutes ahead of time, it can help alleviate a lot of that anxiety. That's the whole premise behind the surprise card. The next few slides are a social story that um, I used with a student who was a high school student. 
A social story is another way of uh, using lots of visual strategies, high interest areas, of, of including some of those things. This is a young man that we uh, had during a training. It was a week-long training. His name is Zachary. Zachary came to us during a training when we had set up the physical structure, the schedules, the work systems, uh, some other things in place before he ever stepped off the bus. We took two days of setting things up and then on the third day he and a group of other students stepped off the bus. Now his teacher had uh, alerted me that Zachary did not have a communication system. Zachary uh, could could talk, but his he had quite limited communication. So oftentimes, what he would do is he would resort to scratching, or biting, or sometimes grabbing your arm. And as the teacher would say, and he can draw blood. He does draw blood. So I thought everything's going to be okay. We had everything in place. Everything was structured. And sure enough, as he's getting off the bus, there's all these teachers, all the participants in the, the workshop, several other kids, two of who, who were screaming at the top of their lungs. And we finally get to the area where Zachary is going to be uh, learning some things. And right away, his eyes got really big. And he was terrified. And he did. He reached out, he grabbed me, and he drew blood. So the whole time, I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, we've got to get him out, out of here. He is so overstimulated. This is way too stimulating for him. So we moved him out into the hallway and um, did some deep pressure. And you're going to see him right here on this slide where we did some deep pressure on his hands. And we also did some deep pressure on his head. Interestingly, after I stopped doing some of the deep pressure on his hand, hands, I held my hands out to him and he grabbed my hands again and he wanted me to do some more deep pressure. I did that several times and when I held my hands out about a third or fourth time he took my hands and put it on his head to, for me to give him that deep pressure. This whole time you could see him starting to relax and of course I was thinking he not only has a lot of sensory issues he doesn't have a communication system. He's 16 years old and does not have a communication system. That afternoon, going back to the, to the hotel, I decided we need to do some sort of a social story and to give him some sort of a communication system. So you're going to see the first part of his communication system in just a bit, where he has the hand, he grabs the hand, uh, the picture of me holding his hand off his communication board, and that means, okay, we're going to do the deep pressure. This is the social story that introduced the communication system. I'm going to read it to you as we go along. <coughs> when I get anxious, sometimes I get anxious. When this happens, I need to tell someone. I want someone to hear what I'm saying. I'm anxious. I don't like this. Sometimes I squeeze an arm and scratch someone. Uh-oh, not a good thing, especially when my fingernails scratch. Ouch. Here's what I can do. Give my stressed out card to Kathy. I want you to squeeze my hand, or I want you to press on my head. I can do this. In this video, you are going to see Zachary use it. And as you watch the video, I want you to be thinking about why was it so successful? What was it about this social story that by uh, that Friday he was not scratching anyone and he was consistently using his card to give it to me to indicate that he wanted that deep pressure? what I can do. Give my stressed out card to Kathy. Here. Thank you. I want you to squeeze my hand or I want you to press. I can do this. See? 
you feel? You want your hands pressed. Oh, thank you. Okay. He's squeezing my hand. <laughs> you like that, huh? Sometimes I get anxious. When this happens, I need to tell someone. I want someone to hear what I'm saying. Uh-oh, not a good thing. Especially when my fingernails scratch. Ouch, ouch. Here's what I can do. I give my stressed out card to Kathy. Oh, thank you. I want you to squeeze my head or my hand. Does that feel good? Okay. Head. Squeeze your head. Or I want you to press on my head. I can do this. <laughs> I want you to squeeze my hand. Or I want you to press on my head. Do you want to press on my head? Help me with hand. Hand. Or head. Hand. Okay. I'm going to do the hand. Here we go. I can do this. I hope you picked up that the social story was read several times to him. It wasn't just one time. It was read to him when he came in in the morning. It was also read several more times, and that's the key to a social story, is that it's not just one time. Uh, you read it several times, especially when you're working on that behavior. As time goes on and the behavior may become uh, more appropriate, then you may uh, decrease it, but it's still recommended that you read it every single day. Going back again to interests, when I, you heard me talking earlier throughout the, the, this seminar about uh, using those high interest areas, and we've already gone over power cards, transition markers, the social story now, as well as surprise cards. We also talked earlier about a schedule and how important a schedule is. This is a schedule who, for a student who is really interested in the Marines. And his schedule had a magnet. You see up there on the right hand corner, that is a magnet, a Marine magnet. And he would move his Marine magnet down as he uh, finished each class period. Or let's just say right there at the bottom, you see some, some uh, specials. You know, they might have uh, packing up specials. They might have assembly. He would move his magnet right there. So it was another way of hooking him into using his schedule. His interest in the Marines was so high that the, the teacher assistant even wrote some work systems, some, uh, some cues for each class. Uh, he loved to call his, his teacher Sergeant Ellis. Her real name was Mrs. Ellis, but he, call, he called her Sergeant Ellis. And you're gonna see a couple of things that the teacher assistant wrote. You know, take out your, your science warm up and answer the question. Put your agenda on your desk. Take out your science journal. Be ready to start science. He would actually follow this much more so and became so much more independent rather than having that teacher assistant next to him the whole time. And again, he had several of them, not only just uh, not only for his science class, but for several of his classes as well that cued him with his Sergeant Ellis sets. We also realize that schedules are uh, not just for our kids with autism. In fact, according to this research, what we realize is that it's for all of our kids, classroom schedules. Those teachers who have those classroom schedules and who refer to those classroom schedules, um, uh, 
consistently, especially when that schedule is over. It may be for a younger child, it might be uh, picture schedules, it might be clip art for, for those kindergartners, that pre-K, that first grade, second grade. It might be just turning the picture over. For our older students, if they can read, it might be just a checkoff schedule, an agenda up on the board for all of the students. The beauty of that is it works for all the students. It's a very structured activity. With many of our students with an autism spectrum disorder, they may need even more individual schedules. And you see right here, this is for an older student. He was really into Sonic the Hedgehog, so we put an interest. Um, it's a high interest area right there. His was a checkoff schedule. You'll notice too that not only did he have a schedule, but beside each uh, uh, subject area, what he's going to be doing during that time just a way of alerting him what the expectations are. Here's another one. On the left hand side, you see Mario. Mario was his transition marker. So when he was, when he saw Mario and he was handed that, that means check off your schedule. Let's go to the next thing. So he had a check off system. So schedules can look different. They all don't have to be board maker schedules and nothing against board maker, but again, Schedules are highly individualized according to what that, that student's interest may be. Here's another one who was having problems getting off the, the computer. And you notice that we've got Hannah Montana because that was a, a her high interest area. And um, we, before computer, we made sure that she was going to have a break before she went home. And hers was a checkoff schedule. Another highly effective uh, way of, of um, introducing some of the, the techniques. This was a feelings chart. And you notice that this feelings chart has anywhere from a five to one. Look how highly individualized it is. Let's just say he's at a five. So his paper clip is over here at the five level. What can you do? And this is actually sitting down with that student and going over during a calm time. What can you do to get from a five to a one. You know, well this is, he came up with some of these strategies himself. I can go to Mrs. Holland. Well, Mrs. Holland was the counselor, so we wrote that down. Um, I, can act to, I can ask to take a break. Well, we had some break cards for him, so he could take a five minute break, a four minute break, a three minute break. He could choose how long it was. You know, he could ask for his therapy. You'll notice that we wrote all of this down so that he can look at, okay, now, now you're at a four. How can we get to a three? What are some of the things it might take to get you to a three? And again, doing this during a calm time. This might be what's considered a postvention technique. And what that means is it's an instructional strategy after the meltdown. When we talk about meltdowns later on in some more presentations, this is one such technique that can be used because you're sitting down with it afterwards to find out how can we prevent this from happening again. Now, you're going to see all the way from a five to a one. You know, when you're finally feeling great, guess what? Enjoy the feeling. You know, have fun. Stay here so that you don't have to continually have to go back and forth. It might be as soon as the student comes in the room, you find out where are you right now? You know, are you at a one? Are you at a two? Um, if you're over here at a four, how can we get you back to a three? How can we get back to a two? Now, this is one example. Another way of using it with something that they're very interested in is this next example, this feelings chart. We just substituted for this student, Mario, because again, this was his high interest area. So we put Mario there, and in this case, writing down for this particular student, what is it that's gonna take you to get from a five to a four to a three? Some of the things that you're going to see on the right-hand side will make you chuckle probably, because as we're writing this, as we're writing it down, I'm thinking, what does he mean cleaning the sidewalks? He liked to go out and help, help the custodian push the broom to clean the sidewalks. And I thought, and this was a fifth grader, and I thought, oh my gosh, he knows, you know, that if I have that large muscle movement and I've got that, 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 that pushing, and that, that's going to help calm me down. 
Uh, already at fifth grade, he knew this is what's going to help calm him down. And that's the beauty of it because we're also teaching our kids how to get in touch with what is it that can help calm me down. How can I teach my teachers, how can I teach the public that these are the ways I can calm down so it finally doesn't go into all the way up to a five and beyond to, to become a meltdown. Bottom line, ideas are like rabbits. You get a couple and learn how to handle them and pretty soon you have a dozen. And that's the beauty of using these techniques. Just to kind of end it, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. The beauty of all of this is for the future of our kids, if not now, when? One of my favorite poems is by someone who is anonymous. We have no idea who wrote this, but I'm going to read this to you just to end this session. Some people see a closed door and turn away. Others see a closed door, try the knob. If it doesn't open, they turn away. Still others see a closed door, try the knob. If it doesn't open, they find a key. If the key doesn't fit, they turn away. A rare few see a closed door, try the knob. If it doesn't open, they find a key. If the key doesn't fit, they make one. In your packet, in your resource, resources, you will find a page that has your prevention, intervention, and postvention strategies. And it is a list uh, of some ideas that we mentioned today. Of course, I didn't go over all of the ideas, but hopefully you'll find something that will work for you as well. Thank you for visiting and coming in, and I hope you are able and I encourage you to use these, these uh, techniques.